Well, currently, um, a good kind of cochlear implants is anybody who has severe to profound deafness who is not benefiting from hearing aids, uh, or in children who is not developing speech and language despite having hearing aids. <clears throat> the um, NICE criteria in the UK has set the, for adults the criteria as being uh, greater than 80 dB hearing loss in any two frequencies between uh, 0.5 and 4 kilohertz and not scoring with your, with your hearing aids, not scoring more than 50% on speech tests, although in children can be based on language rather than speech tests. Uh, what it doesn't cover, what the UK guidelines do not cover though, is people who have a single-sided deafness. Um, so they are not currently covered by the UK government, uh, but there's lots of evidence around from around the world that they can also benefit from the implant on the deaf side, uh, even if they have normal hearing the other side. And the, the other group of people that are not covered uh, are people, uh, adults who want implants on both sides. Children can get implants on both sides, uh, bilateral. Uh, in adults, we're only allowed to implant one side uh, according to uh, NHS criteria. But we know that people do better with two implants than with one implant to get from both sides. So that's another group that's not really covered by the current guidelines. I would also add that the UK guidelines are some of the strictest in the world uh, and in, in some other countries uh, in North America and uh, Germany, for instance, um, the guidelines are a bit less strict and you can have less degree of less degrees of uh, hearing loss and still be a candidate for cochlear implantation. Implants are they're, they're done by um, a, a fairly routine surgery. I mean, we do lots of them. Um, the, uh, the surgery is the same as it is for many other ear surgeries, a cut behind the ear, <clears throat> and the implants are basically, uh, we, drill, we, we drill the mastoid out and get down to the inner ear, uh, and then we, put, we gently and carefully thread the implant into the inner ear, but the part of the ear that's hearing is called the cochlea, and then the implants wrap themselves around the hearing nerve, and they electrically stimulate the nerve. So that's a big difference between implants and hearing aids is that they don't actually put sound in, they electrically stimulate the nerve. So it bypasses all the dead parts of the ear that are usually the cause of, of the hearing loss. Well, I think the most important side effect that people, uh, patients need to understand is that um, you have to go into the implant and assume you're gonna lose any remaining hearing you have in that ear. Uh, about half the time we can um, preserve the hearing, um, but um, we have to always assume that if you have any remaining hearing that ear, you go, you're probably going to lose it. So that can be a very difficult dilemma for some patients because um, if they're hanging on just for the hearing ear to last a little bit of hearing, um, then they really sometimes don't want to give it up and risk it. Um, in general, we try and implant the other ear if you're wearing a hearing aid in one ear uh, and the other ear is. Uh, um, deaf and you're not wearing a hearing aid in that side, we'll try to implant the non-hearing aid ear. Um, but the, for some patients who've been deaf, for instance, for 20, 30, 40 years, they haven't worn a hearing aid on the other side. That makes us nervous because that nerve on the other side might not work anymore as well as we'd like it to. So that part of the thing is important. Other side effects, um, and there are some risks to the surgery. Thank goodness most times we get, we get through the surgery without any problems. Um, but some of the things that, you know, we do worry about and very small risk, but they're not zero, are risk to the nerve that moves the face, the facial nerve. Now uh, there's, um, uh, some people can have a funny taste in the tongue. That's, that's usually temporary, but it, go, it usually goes away, but very occasionally stay a bit longer. There's also a risk of um, infection. Anytime we, we operate on somebody and particularly infection of the implant um, can be delayed or at the time of surgery. In that case, the implant has to be replaced. But those risks are you know, 1% or so, 1 or 2%, not, not very high in the long term. Uh, and there's always a risk of device failure. So the device can fail, um, and um, the risk is low, but it can happen. Every company seems to go through phases when they make a new implant and they, go, they make a bad batch. Um, every few years that happens, um, and then we have to end up replacing a lot of devices. But thankfully, most of the devices can be replaced and they go back to the original function. Um, the way we hear after an implant is fascinating because it's not normal hearing. It's you hearing 
um, through electrical stimulation of the nerve. It's not sound coming in, and the cochlea has not uh, got 30,000 hair cells and, and, uh, and artery neurons. It's got uh, usually between, in, between um, 12 and 20 electrodes we're putting in there. Uh, and so at the beginning, patients will have uh, just hear beeping sounds or robotic sounds, noise. But it's incredible that over time, most patients learn to uh, make sense of that, and it sounds like speech to them. Um, so patients do tend to, <clears throat> their brains fill in a lot of that missing information. And they really do have to work at it, though. They have to practice and uh, go through go through the uh, speech language therapy and, and, and work with the audiologist. And most people can get up to the point where they can have a relatively normal conversation and quiet and use a telephone. Um, uh, but there's a large variability in outcomes. So most people can get to that kind of level. And, and speech does sound like speech to them after a while. Now, music can be more challenging because if you're very musical, um, then I think implants uh, are not really designed, nor is it really possible to get the same kind of musical quality out of an implant that you would get with normal hearing. That's a very good question. I don't think anybody knows the answer to that 100%. Uh, we've only been really implanting them widely for the last 25, 30 years, uh, perhaps. and. Um, um, and uh, I mean, they do seem to last a very long time. Um, the, we are seeing failures of that 20 to 30 year age group uh, once we get a bit older, but we don't really have a good sense of how long they last. Uh, to some extent, um, technology moves on so fast, that's perhaps not a bad idea to replace an old implant with a new implant, uh, because the modern implants have so much more capacity to report what a nerve is doing and be programmable, et cetera, that, uh, it's maybe not a bad idea to get a, get a new one, but they do last decades, at least. 